Okay. It's not, I was going to say, those of you at home may be seated. <laughs> and now you may adjust your hearing aids. <laughs> One of the uh, interesting things about this uh, particular gospel lesson is that it picks up right in the middle of something. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at that and uh, we'll sort of walk our way through this scripture, uh, the 24th chapter of, of Luke. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that we continue to celebrate this glad Easter season. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would continue to be among us and open our minds that we might understand scripture for we ask it in christ's name amen amen um, as i said it's always nice to drop in in the middle of something like the the middle of a conversation or something of that nature but uh when jesus appears to his uh disciples these divisions are kind of arbitrary our lesson begins as they were talking about these things, which begs the question, what things were they talking about? <laughs> uh, we're not told. Uh, you have to back up. And this is uh, where this takes place. This is the evening of that first Easter day. So was last Sunday's lesson from the Gospel of John. These are relating uh, the same story in different ways. But the disciples who were on the Emmaus Road in the Gospel of Luke, if you're familiar with that story, uh, Cleopas and an unnamed disciple um, were walking along. Suddenly, Jesus is with them. He explains the scriptures to them because they didn't understand what was going on. And they invite him to stay and have dinner with them. And after they recognize that this is Jesus, they turn around and go back to Jerusalem. And that's where this story picks up. They come into the upper room, and they're ready to tell their story, and they hear a story. Uh, they knew about the women that morning uh, who had gone to the tomb, but they also hear that he had appeared to Peter. So there's a lot of news being shared here, uh, a, lot, a lot going on, and uh, perhaps a, you know, a, a lot of confusion. Uh, I wanted to share a few things with you. A, a few years ago, when I was in the Army Chaplain School, I say a few years, I should probably say a few decades ago when I was in the Army Chaplain School, uh, we were in a, a class and we were studying uh, the issue of paradigms. I don't know if you're familiar with the word. Uh, it was popular in business for a little while in the 80s, but it's a uh, paradigm. A paradigm is the way you understand something. It's a mental construct that we all have. We have lots of them. But it's the way we understand things and we make sense of things that are going on in our lives. And they wanted to show us that. Um, and so they showed us a, a little film. Uh, this is for the benefit of the, and for those of you watching at home, no. <laughs> write to me, Billy. No. <laughs> if you remember Dr. Graham doing that. Uh, on the screen, they were flashing cards from a playing deck, and we were to write down what we saw. And they were coming fast. They were coming fast. So you didn't write nine of hearts, you wrote nine H and just going in. And so they they flipped through them and it just, you know, going at breakneck speed. And we wrote down what we saw. And then at the end, we compared our answers, and all of us had the exact same answers. It was really cool. And then they showed us the film clip again, slowed down. And we realized we all made the exact same mistake. All of us, every person in the room saw the ace of spades, but there was no ace of spades shown to us. What they showed us was the ace of hearts, colored black. But we, Knowing that there are no black hearts, we forced it to be the ace of spades in our mind. 
When you encounter something that doesn't fit your paradigm of understanding, you will force it to fit. Because the only other option is to come up with a whole new system of belief. You don't want to do that. Um, when we first moved up here, the Belinda and I were driving through the neighborhood one day, and I looked and I saw this huge black dog running across the lawn. And I said, <laughs> look at the size of that dog. Where I came from, bears didn't run through the yard. <laughs> I made that bear be a dog. I forced it into the paradigm. My understanding of what runs through neighborhoods. We have paradigms for everything. And that's, you know, when we see something like that, you know, that didn't fit my paradigm of dogs, didn't fit my paradigm of decks of cards. Now on that Easter evening, the disciples were gathered in the upper room. And suddenly, Jesus just appeared among them. And we're told in scripture that they were startled and frightened. And who wouldn't have been? <laughs> Boom, there he is. That moment did not fit their paradigm for their understanding of life and death. It did not fit any mental constructs that they had whatsoever. It if you think about it, it just had to mentally overload them at that moment. What do you do? What, what is this? What's happening? Because their lifetime of experience, just as our lifetime of experience tells us, death is the end. But suddenly, it's not. And so they had to attempt to force this moment into their paradigm of understanding. Well, it must be a ghost. A disembodied panuma is the Greek word there, a spirit. Remember, the disciples did the exact same thing when Jesus came walking on the water to the, on the boat during the storm. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. They hadn't seen people walk on water in a storm in the dark of the night. You try to force things to fit. So at this point in the upper room, they're terrified. They think they see a ghost. And so Jesus has to do what most of us have to do. Show two forms of identity. <laughs> <laughs> now the first thing he does is says, look at my hands and feet it's me it's me and then it's what he had to eat and he ate some broiled fish obviously he's not a ghost Jesus completely destroyed their paradigm of understanding about life and death this is the risen Lord Jesus Christ, not a ghost, not a dream, not a vision. It's real. And he said to them, I mean, he didn't say dummies, but he said, this is what I told you. This is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, go back to our discussion of paradigms for a moment. When we're exposed to a completely new paradigm, it's called a paradigm shift. <laughs> You're shifting from one, to the, from the old to the new paradigm, a new understanding a new way of interpreting things. And there are a bunch of them, if you think about it, uh, uh, through history, uh, entire civilization. In ancient times, they believed that the earth was the center of the universe. Uh, the Ptolemaic system, named after uh, the uh, Egyptian astronomer uh, Ptolemy, who uh, 
he had a complete construct. Yeah. Here's the earth at the center, and there are several spheres with uh, all of these other things on them, planets and stars, and, and they rotate around us. That was good until 1514 when Copernicus says, you know, I've been watching these things and that's not what they're doing. That's not right. The earth is not the center. He, he was a little off too. He said the sun was the center. He was right about the solar system and the paradigm shifted. And if you follow science through the years, it keeps shifting to new understandings. You get a whole new paradigm. I mean, now we're not the center of anything. We're kind of insignificant out on the edge of this huge galaxy, which is just one of millions of galaxies. Kind of makes you feel small and insignificant, doesn't it? But you're not. Christ loves you. But our paradigm of the universe keeps shifting. The paradigm of uh, medicine keeps shifting as we move and learn new things. The disciples who were with Jesus in that upper room were distinctly Jewish. Now, this isn't something we think about that much, but they were all Jewish. They all had a Jewish interpretation of Holy Scripture. And it should be absolutely no surprise to anyone that a lot of Scripture that we share in common, we view differently especially the things that Jesus was talking about here, the things that speak of him in the law and the prophets and in the Psalms. A Jewish interpretation will not see Jesus in any of those. Jesus, for them, is not the Messiah. They interpret it differently. And so every one of them in this room had that as their paradigm of understanding Holy Scripture. But we're told that Jesus opened their minds. He opened their minds to see the truth of Scripture. An acquaintance of mine, who is a, uh, he's now a Presbyterian pastor, a very conservative one. Uh, he was raised as a devout Jew. Even into his adulthood, observing all the festivals. And, uh, and when he became a Christian, he said it was amazing to him when the Holy Spirit opened his mind to the interpretation of Scripture. When the Spirit did that, he said it was all new. It was all different, and it was transformative, and it changed his life. And he came to Christ, and now leads others to Christ. But the thing he said I liked the most was, Everything was new. Everything was new. It was, he didn't say it this way, but it was a major paradigm shift in his life. His understanding of scripture and how it reveals Jesus Christ and his good news message. Very profound shift. In the upper room that evening, Jesus was doing this for the disciples. We're told he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead. And on the third day, and, and repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is the same thing he did on the road to Emmaus, just before this story when he was walking with the two disciples. And he said to them, as they related to him, how confused they were about things. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. And then when they sat down at table with Jesus and he broke the bread and they realized who he was, he vanished and they said, were not our hearts burning within us while 
He talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Another thing, uh, uh, Father Chris and I were talking about this this morning. One of the great things about resurrection is apparently you get to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he sits down at table with those two disciples, breaks bread, shows up, eats a piece of fish. And in the Gospel of John, uh, when they meet him uh, there by the, the sea, he's got a charcoal fire going with fish for breakfast. So... If nothing else, there's going to be a fish fry when we get to heaven. <laughs> be ready. Take your tartar sauce with you. But Jesus told them this, he, and then he opened their minds to this understanding, and it was a complete shift in the way they were going to live their lives and the way they interpreted Scripture, the way they interpreted their relationship with Jesus, their risen Lord. And he told them, you are witnesses of these things. Jesus did not open up scripture and the understanding of scripture in their minds for their own sake. I mean, that's part of it. That's part of, you know, I'm, uh, you know, a lot of wow, gee whiz things every time I read scripture, constantly seeing new things as the spirit moves uh, and understanding things more fully. But that's not for me necessarily. I mean, I, I am nourished by it, of course. But it's not supposed to stop there with me or with you. You were witnesses to these things, and Jesus told them it's going to move to all the nations of the world, beginning in Jerusalem and out. That's why I always liked uh, the, Jerusal the Jerusalem cross. Many of you are familiar with it. It shows that the gospel left Jerusalem in all four directions. <laughs> left in every direction. Of course, we only know, you know, oh gosh, it left. And it went up into uh, Asia Minor and over into Europe. And because we know Acts and we know the, the uh, letters of Paul and we read about those things. But it was going on everywhere, not just in the book of Acts. Um, if you're a, a history student, you know, Marco Polo showed up in India and was stunned. There were Christians. Christian churches, and they took him to the tomb of Thomas and said and told him that Thomas had carried the gospel all the way to India. So, wow, that wasn't in Acts, you know. And, and people show up in Ethiopia, they're Christians, there were Christians everywhere in all directions. It was just as Jesus said, it moved out. And they took the good news message of the forgiveness of sins, repentance first, and then the forgiveness of sins, repentance and forgiveness, took it out into the world. <clears throat> this is where we come into the story. We enter the story here. We're gathered in our upper room, sort of. And Jesus will make himself known to us in this meeting. He'll make himself known to you in many ways, not just here on Sunday, but also in your private devotional time. He will make himself known to you today in the breaking of the bread, the pouring of the wine. And he's opening our minds to the understanding of scripture constantly. As you listen to his word read, as we listen to his word through music, as we hear it in sermons, and as we hear it in prophetic words, Jesus, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, is constantly opening our minds to scripture because we live in a whole new paradigm, different than the one before we became Christians, that we live. We've gone from the old life to a new life. 
and we've become part of that new covenant relationship with God. We're in the new. And we are witnesses of this. We have seen and heard all of these things, just as the disciples did in the upper room. We've seen it. We've heard it. We know it. And we have the message of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. We say it every Sunday. And you just heard it in John, 1 John 1, 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you watch the news or you read the news, you know there's a, a lot of despair um, over gun violence. There's a lot of despair over elections and election reforms. There's all kinds of despair about all kinds of things and nations rattling their swords at one another and famine. and other horrible things happening all around the world. The world is in an old, worn out paradigm. They need for us to tell them about the new one. And I promise you, if everybody in the world lived in this new paradigm, those issues wouldn't be there. What the world needs is Jesus Christ. It's that simple. It's the message that transformed my life. It's the message that has transformed your life and still transforming it. It's a message that could transform our society. It's a message that could transform and change the world. It's not just for us. It's not just for us. The world needs to know this. And they're not going to know it if we don't share it. And so I'm admonishing myself and I'm admonishing you to... Share this new. Think about how exciting this message really is. And people like sharing exciting things. Go back and remember what it was like when you first came to know Christ. Ask God to rekindle that. So that like those uh, disciples on the Emmaus Road. Our hearts will burn. Our hearts will burn with the news. And our hearts burn within us. And the only way to put out that fire is to spread it. So it's my prayer today that uh, you and I and other brothers and sisters in the faith will share this amazing new understanding of what life is about, what our relationship with God is about, and that Christ is alive and has risen from the dead. We have a relationship with the living God. Amen. Thank you.